It was an occasion that happened every once in a while, not very often, and yet when it did, it often raised my heart or my pulse. Because oftentimes I would see my dad's name scrawled across my phone as it was ringing as he had called me. Now you have to understand, my dad isn't exactly a social talker when it comes to the phone. It's, simple, it's just simply a utility device that he's calling for some particular need and nothing else. He's not exactly calling to just talk or shoot the breeze. And so often there were a couple of things that I knew whenever I saw his name and his number pop up. First, I knew likely why he was calling. First, I had done something wrong. That I was on the farm, I had messed something up, or I hadn't done something exactly to his specifications, and so I needed to go back and fix it. Or second, he needed more help. Maybe it was at the end of the day, and I was starting to put everything back into the shed, put all the tools away, and yet he still needed something more. But the other thing I knew was this. I had no choice but to respond. Because I knew I'd be in trouble if I didn't. If I heard the voice, if I heard the message of my father, there was no choice but to respond to whatever the need was, whether it was correcting a mistake or simply going and doing more work. And often we likely have experiences with those different individuals in our life, whether they call us or whether they talk to us, whether it's a family member, whether it's a coworker, whoever it might be, that someone is communicating with us, they have a message, and it merits and necessitates a response. But do we respond or just simply kind of let it go to the wayside and kind of move on with our life? And even in our life of faith, we have to ask ourselves the same question about Jesus. Whenever he's speaking a message to us, which he does, do we respond or do we just simply let the message fall on deaf ears? We started off this morning with the book of the prophet Ezekiel, and this is very early in the book, and so it's giving us a story of his commissioning, that it's telling us about whenever the Lord came to Ezekiel. And so the Spirit of the Lord, we're told, it comes to him, and it sets him on his feet. It gives him purpose, it gives him motivation, it tells him that there is something to accomplish. But then the voice starts to speak to him, that it tells him that he's sending him forward, and that it's going to send him to the Israelites. We might think to ourselves, well, good, he's being commissioned as a prophet, that he's being sent forward. He's going to give some, get some sort of honor. He's going to get some prestige, some recognition. Not so fast, because Jesus tells, or the Lord tells him very clearly what's going to happen, that as he sends him forward to the Israelites, the very people that we would expect to listen, there's going to be a lot of obstinacy, meaning hard-heartedness. They're not going to listen all that well. That, in fact, there's going to be so much in that present day. And even in their ancestors, it's been a long tradition of not listening to the prophets or to the ones that speak on behalf of the Lord. That they're going to be cold-hearted, that they're going to be hard of heart. They're not going to listen. They're going to often rebel against the Lord, as they've so often done before. But he tells them, nonetheless, to go forward and to speak. Because it's not for the message of acceptance that that is not the marker of success in Ezekiel's own ministry and commissioning as a prophet. But what is the marker of success is simply that a prophet has been heard because he wants the people to be warned that they can't look back whenever everything is said and done and say, well, we never heard the voice of the Lord. There was never a prophet. There was never one speaking on behalf of our God. Indeed, there was. And that was Ezekiel's whole purpose. He was to go to warn the people whether they heeded the voice of the Lord or whether they resisted. It was simply his call to go forward and to speak whatever the Lord encouraged him to speak. And it's rather interesting, the responsorial psalm that follows right after this. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord, pleading for his mercy. It isn't exactly reflecting the Israelites at that time, but who it is reflecting is Ezekiel, because then we see in the third verse that there is the speaking of the arrogance, that he wants to be saved from them, from those that will not hear the voice of the Lord. And that is where the response to the psalm plugs in, that it's Ezekiel's own prayer, that he might be heard, but ultimately be saved from those who think themselves too good for God. We move on to the second reading, which is taken from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. And he speaks a very intriguing message, and it's oftentimes one of my favorites. Because at the very beginning, we hear that he would be elated by all of the many re the revelations that he has received, but for the thorn and the affliction in his side. 
and we think about this thorn, this affliction, and he begins to describe it in even more vivid color because he says that it's a sort of fallen angel that the devil has sent to tempt him and to molest him in some way, that it's there to oppress him and cause life to be difficult. And this thorn is so oppressive to him that he petitions the Lord not once, not twice, but three separate times that this thorn be removed from his side. So difficult it was for him to continue to endure it. But notice what the Lord's response is to that request. No, he's not going to take away the thorn because he wants him to realize that his grace is sufficient for Paul. His power is made perfect in weakness. For it is in the moments that Paul is weak that the Lord is his strength. And Paul says this very riveting line at the very end. He says, For whenever I am weak, it is then that I am strong. Imagine just hearing this as the church in Corinth at the time, that whenever one is weak, whenever they are powerless, it is then they are strong because of the Lord and because of his divine aid. That is the message of Paul, that he recognizes there's affliction, there's all sorts of persecution, trials, circumstances that he's going to have to endure. But nonetheless, he endures all by the grace of God. And if he does that, he will be successful. Then we move on to the gospel. In this gospel, according to Mark, we see that Jesus, he's going into his native place, which is the town of Nazareth, with his disciples. And we might expect to ourselves that this is Jesus. This is the one that has been spoken about for so long. This is the Son of God, Son of Man. This is the Word incarnate and the Word made flesh. This is the one. So certainly he should be received with accolades, with a lot of celebration, a lot of joy. Not so. We hear that Jesus, he goes into the synagogue, he begins to speak, and the people are kind of taken aback. They hear what he's saying, and they say, where did he get all this? Where are the words of wisdom coming from? How is he able to work mighty deeds? And we might think that they think about that, and they're still okay with him, but that's not what the gospel says. It says they took offense at him that they saw what he was doing. They were jealous. They were furious that the Lord had gifted him in such a way. And so they actually turned away from him because they were so jealous and they just simply could not receive the message. And the Lord simply speaks into this reality. He says, A prophet is not without honor except in his own native place, amongst his own kin, and in his own house. So he was unable to perform any mighty deed there apart from curing a few of the sick by laying his hands on him. But notice this very last line. It's a powerful line. He was amazed at their lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Lord in his humanity, he knew that he was often going to be rejected. But he goes into the town of Nazareth hoping for some sort of celebration. And yet what happens? There's a complete lack of faith. Everything falls through. The message that he's speaking in good faith that they might receive it. It's rejected. He's spurned. He's cast aside. A very early foreshadowing of the crucifixion. But we hear all this and we wonder, because that was in the town of Nazareth so long ago, or even whenever the prophet Ezekiel is speaking to that rebellious house, which is the house of Israel. Whenever he's speaking to them, he too is rejected. What about what our response would be? If Jesus walked into our midst, would he be amazed? Or would he be amazed by a lack of faith? Because to understand what this means, we need to delve back into the readings because they speak so powerfully to where we are and where the Lord is encouraging us to be. So the first thing that the readings, they prove to us that there are prophets in our midst. There is the great prophet, which is Jesus Christ himself. He comes to us in word, in scripture, in prayer, in the sacraments, in so many different avenues of grace that we are able to receive. The Lord wants to be present to us in so many ways. And so we can't say that we don't know where the Lord is or that he's light years away. He's right here in our midst in so many different elements and so many different modes. It's impossible to say that there is not a prophet in our midst. Unless we need someone that's tangible, someone that's going to speak word that's going to directly impact our ears, then he sends prophets in his stead. That he sends ministers, bishops, priests, and deacons to speak the word, to break it apart, and to continue to nourish the people of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so indeed, the prophets are here, even in our midst in our day and age. 
And if prophets are here, there's a message for each of us. Now, yes, corporately, there's always the message of salvation that comes to us through the gospel. But there is always a message for us personally to receive. The Lord is always reaching out to us in some way. That he wants his voice to be heard by our hearts and by our souls to the very depth of our being. And that is always a reality. The Lord speaks to us, even in the moments we don't think we can hear him. He's speaking if we take the time to hear. But that might beg the question. If the Lord sends sends prophets, if the Lord has given us a message, oftentimes, why do people not respond? Why do we not want to respond? Why are there only about a third of Americans in this nation that are only identifying as religious, or at least devoutly religious? Why, are there, why is there so much despondence in our day and age? We need to go back to the town of Nazareth because we need to understand what was going on. Why exactly were they so quick to write Jesus off? That there was a certain familiarity, and that, in fact, was the problem. They knew Jesus from the time that he was little, and therefore, because of that, they started to think, well, he can't do anything great. Or they started to say, he's a carpenter, he's the son of Mary, he's all these things. That this power that has been given to him, it's all an illusion. Therefore, we discredit everything he says and put him to the side. Or maybe it was the message. Maybe the Lord was speaking something that was hard to hear. Because whenever a prophet speaks, there's three different modes that they can speak. They can speak a word to help the people understand the faith better. Or maybe they can speak a word of comfort because they know that the people need hope. They need the joy of salvation. They need to know their God and how much he loves them. Or maybe it was a message of conviction. Maybe it was a message telling the people that you're kind of on the right path, but you need to turn just a little bit more. Or these things that you're doing, you need to stop those things, abandon them, and return to the Lord your God. Maybe it was the message that he was speaking. They didn't really want to hear it. That he was speaking those messages that were convicting him, that were telling them that they needed to be better, that they could be a better people of faith, that they could respond to the Lord their God. And in fact, they didn't want to. Maybe they were just jealous. They thought that they'd been passed by. Maybe they thought the Lord had never listened to their prayer, and yet he listened to the Son of Mary, the simple carpenter. Why would he listen to him and not to me? Maybe there was some resentment because they felt that they weren't answering. There's all sorts of reasons that they could have rejected the Lord their God, but it's important for us to go back to that because in our own day and age, and even in our own hearts and souls, sometimes there's a struggle. Sometimes there are reasons that we want to put Jesus to the side. Sometimes there are ways that we simply want to reject the message and to move on. Maybe perhaps it's all that we live in the age of distraction. Maybe there are too many things going on. Maybe it's all the devices that are constantly beckoning for our attention. Or maybe it's that we've got too many other obligations. That faith is just one amongst many. And therefore it kind of gets the leftovers, kind of the scraps of our time. That we can kind of eke out maybe one hour on Sunday, but that's about all we got. And maybe that's the reality. Or maybe there is hurt. Maybe there are wounds in our heart and our soul. Things that have gone wrong, or we feel that the Lord has not answered our prayer, and therefore we say, is this man not just a mere carpenter? Sounds like a great guy, but he's not really helping me out at all. Or maybe there's just a, so, there's this sort of spiritual arrogance that can enter in. And it's not so much that we directly say that we are better than God, but the, sometimes we can say it through our actions. That sometimes we say to ourselves, I've got all the strength I need. I've got everything right here. I've got my own two hands. I've got all my skill, my ability, my knowledge, my intellect, my power, and therefore I can go and pave my own path. That we think that we're strong enough. But if St. Paul teaches us anything, we're not strong enough. If we're honest with ourselves, each of us have got thorns of affliction. Each of us have got weakness. Each of us have temptations that we struggle with in our life. And maybe we succumb to them, maybe we don't. Maybe we're trying to remain steadfast against all the calls and temptations of this world. Maybe we've got those thorns. And my brothers and sisters, each of us do. Each of us have got those places where we are meant to not rely on our own strength, but on the strength of the Lord. Often it's been said that the Lord will not allow us to be stretched beyond our strength or beyond our ability, or will not allow us to be tested beyond our own control. And that's true if we, if we clarify and qualify it. 
The Lord will not allow us to be tested beyond our strength with His grace. Because the Lord wants us to understand that reliance upon Him is security, it's joy, it's peace. And it ultimately will bring us the fulfillment and satisfaction that often we long for, especially in this rat race that we run every single day of our lives. If we truly rely upon the Lord, then we know that we have the source of strength. We don't need to be arrogant, we don't need to be obstinate, we don't need to be hard of heart. Or maybe sometimes we just feel that we've heard the same thing over and over again. The life of faith has been given to us, but ultimately we just haven't felt those sparks. We haven't felt the call to conversion. We say, that's great for other people, but here I am back in my own reality. And in each and every one of those things, we set out to shove Jesus into a box, to compartmentalize him, to say, I'll live my faith at this very moment, at this hour on Sunday, but here's the rest of my life. What if Jesus ask, is asking you for more? What if Jesus wants to be part of everything? What if he wants to be your source of strength when you don't have the answer? What if he wants to be your source of consolation when everything is falling through? What if he wants to be the one that continues, though he get, has that power of conviction, to tell us we're doing wrong, to also tell us when we're doing right? What if the Lord wants to be there? Because my brothers and sisters, we live in a day and an age that really wants to classify Jesus and to shove him in a box or to make him out to be what they want him to be. Maybe just a good guy, a nice friend, the person that we turn to at the end of our life and it's all okay. But the Lord wants to be more than that. Because the Lord walks into the town of Nazareth. He walks into our very heart and soul. And he wants to be accepted. And he wants his message to be heard and responded to. He doesn't want us to be despondent, to be cold-hearted, and to just look at the Lord whenever we have no other option, no other recourse, that everything else has fallen through. But the Lord wants to be there at our every moment, and he wants to speak into our hearts. What does that mean? We need hearts that are supple, that are soft, that are able to take the Word of God, that are not hardened by all the things that go on in this life, or by our own self-reliance, or by our own skill, by our own grandeur, or by all of the things that can distract us in this life. We can't have hearts that are hardened by that, because they'll never hear the Word of God. Or rather, we need hearts that are humble, hearts that are open, hearts that are pure, hearts that continue to seek the Lord our God. And this too means that we should frequent the sacrament of reconciliation as well, because so often why our hearts are hardened is because we're overlooking sin in our life. We're overlooking those things that we struggle with time and time again. That oftentimes, whether it's impurity, whether it's gossip, whether it's lying, whether it's just simply not being a good person or being charitable in some way, oftentimes we start to write those things off and they deafen us to God's voice so that the Lord walks through and we're instantly obstinate and offended at what he has to say. But what if we're open to the Lord? We can be led to a place of comfort, of reassurance, that we can have all sorts of things revealed to us as St. Paul had those revelations to him. But nonetheless, it calls us to be open, to be humble, to have that supple heart that is willing to receive the Word of God, however it comes to us. And we should seek for that, and we should be open to that, and pray for the grace of God to give us that heart. Because God is speaking to us. What's the message he's saying right now? And then the final thing that we should consider... The Lord called the prophet Ezekiel into a day and age, whenever it was most advantageous. He knew Ezekiel was going to be met by a lot of resistance, but he called him because he was the person that he wanted as his instrument to do his will. He needed someone to go and speak his word to the people. Who are the people in your life and in my life that are desiring to hear the word of God? Who are the people that God has called each of us to go forward and to speak the words of life and truth to? Because I dare say, and I would wager, that there's at least one or two people in each of our own lives that need to hear the gospel, that need to hear the truth, or even the words of comfort that the Lord desires us to spread to them and to speak to them, or maybe even those words of conviction, as hard as they might be, encouraging them to return to the Lord, to take their faith seriously, to see what the Lord has planned next for them in their life. Because we too are called to be prophets, and we need not fear if we be rejected. Ezekiel was rejected, and so was our Lord. How could we be any different? And we live in a day and an age that is largely obstinate, that's hard of heart, that does not recognize that Jesus is walking in their midst, in the sacraments, in the Word, in the Scriptures, and even in ministers that continue to do the will of God on this earth. We live in a day and an age that's largely trying to be ignorant of these things and wants to be indifferent and kind of shove Jesus to the side. 
Do you and I have the courage and the fortitude to speak those words of truth, to speak the message Jesus gives to us, even when we, re when we risk rejection, when we re risk being ostracized, whenever we risk being put to the side, whenever someone says, where did they get all this? Are we willing to be the people of God and to speak the message he wants us to speak? Because much like my dad, whenever I saw that number come up on my phone, I knew I needed to answer. It was something, it might be a conviction, it might be something that he was asking a question about. It could even be that I needed to go and correct something. But it didn't matter. I needed to respond. And it should be so with us whenever we hear the Lord is calling to us, that we need not simply just sit there and kind of let faith pass us by. That we need not live our life of faith just simply in a place of comfort. Because comfort breeds complacency. Rather, what our Lord wants us to do is to be faithful, to see the way he enters into Nazareth. He enters into our heart and our soul so that he can speak and minister to us even in ways we may not expect. Jesus entered into Nazareth that day. He was amazed at their lack of faith. He's knocking on the door of our heart and our soul. He wants to enter in. Is he going to be amazed by a lack of faith or be amazed at our response?